In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Repenting is a bit like vomiting. If you want the world to watch you do it, it's not real. So we've all been there when you've had a bad case of the flu, and what's the last thing in the world you want when you're shivering in a mess and you've got the cold, clammy sweats, and every five minutes you're having to run into the bathroom to empty your guts into the toilet? The last thing you want is for your friends to gather around you. You don't want them to see you when you're in this miserable, pathetic condition. You don't want people looking at you as you have to run into the bathroom and vomit up everything in your system as they have to look upon you in this moment of great shame and humiliation when this is happening to you. There's nothing that you want more than to hide this from the sight of the world. You don't want anyone to see you in this moment when you're having to fully acknowledge in this vomitous act what a broken, pathetic person you are. So the only reason you would want anyone to watch you vomit is because you're not actually sick and there's just something you want to get out of the external act. So if you have, for example, a boss who never believes it when people are calling in sick and you want to go home for the day, you might stick your finger down your throat and barf into the, into the garbage can right next to you in order to make a good case in order to get something out of the external act so that you can get the rest of the day off. Or for a weirder example, one that's a bit more fitting for our sermon, imagine a man runs up to a beautiful woman and he sneakily sticks his finger down his throat and vomits right next to her. And then he says, oh, I'm so sorry for that. You see, I, I just inhaled a bunch of smoke as I was saving a bunch of orphans from a burning building and I really tried to hold it all inside, but I'm afraid I just couldn't. Well, in this instance, the man isn't sick. He doesn't view himself to be a pathetic, broken person in this instance. Rather, he wants this woman to see this act happen so he can use this outward act as a means to impress her, to gain her approval, to make her look at him and think, wow, I wish I was as committed to helping as this guy is. What a, what a fantastic, marvelous man. I want to get to know him better. So he's not really sick. If he were, he'd be filled with the kind of humiliation and shame that makes people want to keep their pathetic condition hidden from the eyes of the world. And so it is with repentance. So when we recognize the depths of our sin, we don't want people around. We don't want anyone to see. When you have had that moment of realizing what a wicked, wretched human being you are, the last thing in the world you want is for other people to be gazing at you. You want to lock yourself in the silence and the darkness of your own rooms when you can feel how it is that you've shattered the Ten Commandments to pieces before you. You want to hide this from the eyes of everyone around you. You want to lock yourself away from the world and just vomit up your guilt where no one else can see it. So when we invite the world to look at us vomiting up that guilt, this is the greatest indication of all that we don't actually feel any guilt. When we want the world to watch us repent, this is only because there's something we want to get out of that external act of repentance. This is what Jesus is talking about in our gospel text for this evening when he warns us against disfiguring our faces and, and fasting like the hypocrites. Now, fasting is not always a common practice among us today, but historically speaking, it was a spiritual discipline first among Jews and then among Christians. It carried with it a kind of repentance character to it. It was, a sense, in a sense, spiritual stretching. It was a way to beat down the desires of your body when they hungered for food. So by denying yourself food when you were hungering for it, you were training yourself to say no to your body when that same flesh desired something sinful. So fasting was, in, in, in essence, an external recognition of the kind of poor, miserable, sick, pathetic, vomitous sinner that you are, that you are such a pathetic sinner that you need to guard yourself with all of your might against temptation through this act of fasting. So when these hypocrites that Jesus talks about would disfigure their faces, they would do this so that the world would know that they were fasting. They would do this so that the world would look at them like a woman who just looks at a man who's used vomiting as an excuse to boast of how it is that he saved a bunch of children from a burning building so that the world would look at them and say, my goodness, look at this man nobly struggling in his fight against sin. Look at how he's so keenly aware of his sinful nature and he's doing everything he can to fight off temptation. I wish I could be as committed to righteousness as that guy. 
So just like the guy who vomits in front of that beautiful woman, they do this because they wanted to use the outward act to make themselves look righteous to the people around them. And while we may not fast or disfigure our faces today, we're still guilty of this hypocritical sin. We're still guilty of using the outward appearance of being repentant Christians to make ourselves look righteous to the world. Why do so many people in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod think that they have the right to walk into any LCMS congregation in the country and take communion without actually speaking a word to the pastor beforehand? Why do they get act put out and offended when the pastor actually tries to do his responsibility of being a steward of the mystery of God and examining the people who are coming to his altar to make sure that they're receiving the sacrament rightly, that they're receiving it to their benefit and not to their judgment? So why do people act entitled to the sacrament, to the Lord's Supper? After all, it's a humiliating thing to believe that you actually need this. It's a humiliating thing to say that you are such a miserable, pathetic pile of vomitous sin that you need the righteousness that comes to you in the Lord's Supper. It's an act of spiritual vomiting, emptying your sinful guts right in front of someone to say that you deserve nothing from, but God, from, uh, from God but wrath and therefore you need this divine food to save your life. So why would we act entitled to that? Because we want to go through the outward act to make ourselves look like good, pious Christians. Because we want that experience of disfiguring our faces by walking up in front of everyone, announcing ourselves to be such terrible sinners who so desperately need this gift of God. We want to have people watch as we disfigure our faces as we triumph over our sinfulness, going through the motions of taking communion. And it's the same mentality that's at the heart of so much hypocrisy in the church. Why is it that when young folks who are getting married, who haven't come to church for years, all of a sudden feel entitled to a church wedding? Why would they even go through the motions of saying we are poor, miserable sinners who need God's blessing, who need God's blessings on our marriage in order to preserve this union that we're entering? Why would they want that external action? Why would they want to confess, to vomit out in front of the world that they are so sinful that in every day of their married life they're going to need God's blessing in order to be kept from sin? Why would they say that? Why would they make that confession when they don't actually believe it as is evidenced by their attendance or lack thereof? Why? Because they want to use that outward appearance of the thing to look like good, pious Christians that everyone should be impressed by. When, when people are causing divisions in a congregation, do you know where it is that they oftentimes choose to sit on Sunday mornings? Smack dab in the front pew. Now, I'm not picking on those of you who happen to be in the front pew this evening. I'm not trying to make any accusations. But this is a common thing. Ask pastors when they, uh, uh, who have served in the parish for a number of years when there have been fights in the congregation and all of a sudden this, uh, this causes someone to get up from where they normally sit, maybe towards the back or towards the middle, and all of a sudden there they are up in the very front row see, speaking loud enough for everyone to see that they are poor, miserable sinners singing the words of repentance at the top of their lungs. And why do they do this? Because they want to use the appearance of the church to force everyone to look at them and concede these are good, fine Christian people who are being treated so miserably by us inferior Christians. Look, if you got pulled over for a speeding on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday evening, why is it that the first thing out of your mouth would be, I'm sorry, Pastor, it's just I was late for church. Well, would you say that because you want him to know what a poor, miserable, pathetic sinner you are. Would, that's right, you wouldn't. Would you, say, would, you say to, would you say that to him because you desperately want him to know how it is that you need God's forgiveness for your idolatry, for your hatred, for your lust, for your covetousness? Would you tell him this because you want him to see you vomiting up all of this guilt in front of him? Would you actually unload and confess your deepest, darkest sins to that man? No, of course not. You tell him this because you want to disfigure your face in order to impress him, to use the badge of being a good, profoundly righteous Christian person, the kind of person who doesn't at all deserve to get a speeding ticket. So here we are on Ash Wednesday, this great day of repentance. 
And rather fittingly, here in our gospel text for tonight, Jesus calls us to repent of our fake repentance. To repent for putting on this hypocritical display, for vomiting in front of others to win their approval. For using God's call to repent as a chief means to glorify ourselves. And as for this sin, as well as every other, that Christ came into this world, Jesus came into the flesh to take away this self-righteousness from us. Tonight, as we celebrate Ash Wednesday, we celebrate the love of a Savior who came into this world so that He could reach out with His nail-pierced hands and rip this self-righteousness out of us, along with all of your other transgressions, along with every other sin that God commanded you to vomit out of your being in order to be righteous. So once you were a pasty, sick, sweaty, vomitous mess. But out of his love, God sent Christ in this world to take away your sickness. To heal you by taking every vomit-inducing sin out of you. And putting it on himself in the cross. And that's what Christ has done. So from the cross, Jesus took your self-righteousness away. And made it his own sin. He took the blame for it himself. He swallowed the wrath of God that you had earned and made it his own from the cross. Jesus disfigured his face in agony as he was punished for your hypocritical disfiguring of your face. From the cross, Jesus fasted of the love of his Father. He let it, allowed it to be taken away from him so that he could hand that love over to you and swallow the wrath that you had earned from the cross. Jesus took the shivering cold sweat that you earned from your own sins and he made it his own condition. He made himself into a sick, pathetic, dying mess so that no sickness, no patheticness, no death would ever infect infect your soul again. And while you once vomited up your sins and guilt from the cross, Jesus ended the hour of your sickness. He ended your repentant vomiting by vomiting up his own blood from his hands and feet pierced with nails, from the brow pierced with the crown of thorns, Jesus vomited out his blood, spewed forgiveness out of his veins and covered you in that forgiveness. With that blood poured out from his body, Jesus washed it over you and covered you in it. And in doing so, he dissolved the guilt within you that kept trying to force its way out of your body. From his cross, Jesus vomited out his blood and because he did, you have nothing left, no sin, no guilt, no sorrow to vomit up. Because of Christ's forgiveness, because he gave up his dying breath for you, there are no poisonous sins left in your body that have to be forced out of you in order for you to be made righteous. And because death vomited Christ himself back up, because the grave couldn't handle the taste of Christ's perfection, then death will do the same thing for you, vomiting you back up on the last day because he's been covered in because you have been covered in the same holiness and perfection of Jesus. So when it comes to repentance, when it comes to this act of spiritual vomiting, then for us Christians, all the guilt and shame and sorrow is gone. Christ has taken it all away. So now, when we speak our words of repentance, whether we do that in the darkness of our closet or whether we're surrounded by our fellow saints on Sunday morning, we, now we can acknowledge that our sinful, sick, pathetic existence, we can acknowledge in all confidence that the hour of vomiting is over, that the guilt is taken away, that the poisonous sin that needs to come out of our flesh is already gone, washed away from us through the bloody forgiveness of Jesus Christ that has been poured out upon us in the waters of baptism, in the word of absolution, and in the body and blood of our Savior found in the bread and the wine. And this is why we come to church. This is why we gather here. So while Christ, com- uh, while Christ forbids us from practicing our righteousness to be seen before men, at the same time He gathers us together and commands us to come together in repentance as one body of believers. And why do we do that? Why are we free as Christians to come together and confess the depths of our wickedness to each other? Why is it that we can gather together and fall apart in tears and have, each, and have us look at each other in sorrow as we pour out this sinfulness, as we vomit up all of this horrible wretchedness within us? Why are we free to do that as Christians? 
Because here in the church, this is the place where Christ has, pro- has pronounced that, uh, that the hour of our vomiting is over. Here where we gather together as, sin- as sinful, sick people, this is the place where Christ has commanded that all of our sorrows, all of our sicknesses, all of the wickedness within us, it's now gone. This is the place where Christ promises that through the words spoken in holy absolution, through the words spoken in baptism, through the words spoken in the Lord's Supper, that the hour of our sickness is now ended and over and done with. So don't be afraid to repent today. Don't be afraid to come into the presence of God and your fellow Christians and acknowledge the sinner that you are. Don't be afraid because God has already buried that sinner in Christ's tomb. This Ash Wednesday all throughout this Lenten season and in every day of your life. Don't be afraid of spiritually vomiting because there's nothing left for you to vomit up. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.